Good evening, worshiping friends. November 1st, 2023. I hope you're all well, feeling well in this world of woe. I'm going to hold off on this scripture just for a little bit, and we'll get to that soon enough. But if you were, hold on a second. Oh, there. If you're over 50, you might re remember a difficulty from the 70s. In 1979, you may remember some tense moments because at that time, over 50 Americans from the American embassy were held hostage in Iran, in Tehran, and that ranged from the uh, charge d'affaires to the junior members of the staff from, from the embassy taken hostage for, do you remember how many days? 444 days. 444 days kept in a room overseen by men with guns. These are Americans, couldn't get out. Jimmy Carter was at the end of his wits trying to find a way. While in the United States, there was a lot of hope that they would send a team in, as the Israelites did at Entebbe, to rescue these people. But that never happened. So if you're over 50, you should remember this. If you're not, you might want to take a look back in your history and see something about it because right now we're facing something very similar and that is approximately 500 americans and their family members who are trapped in gaza right now as hostages under federal law at least that's what marcia blackburn tells us and i'm looking at a little article here from the patriot post and regarding uh, this, she says Hamas is holding approximately 500 Americans hostage. The Biden administration needs to formally declare these individuals hostages and explain to the American people how they're working to secure their release without appeasing Hamas. We can't be in a situation where the U.S. government is giving in to the demands of terrorists. On another news site, it tells us that these hostages are in the process of being sprung free. That's what Anthony Blinken tells us from uh, the Senate Committee of Appropriations. However, this same news came to us back in 79, that there was going to be a release and that the American government was negotiating with the Tehran Islamic fundamentalist government, and it didn't happen, and it didn't happen, and it didn't happen. They couldn't get out. So this is a situation where we have practically the same thing going on here. It could lead to a debacle when it comes to these hostages, we pray that it's not going to be another 444 days. Of course, they're coming out through Egypt, which is a good thing. However, Hamas is very difficult to guess what they're going to do next. It's funny that they would even be ready to let those hostages go where they are now. So there's only really one thing we can do as believers, and that is to turn to Isaiah 49 and other places as well. I'm going to look at verses 8 through 11, and I believe you have these before you. Thus says Yahweh, in an acceptable time have I heard you, and in a day of salvation have I helped you, and I will preserve you 
and give you for a covenant of the people to establish the earth, to cause to inherit the desolate heritages, that you may say to the prisoners, go forth to them that are in darkness, show yourselves. They will feed in the ways or the roads and their pastures shall be in all high places. Yet they will not hunger or thirst Neither shall they heat, nor shall the sun smite them. This is a good place to kill, claim in this particular difficult time, especially with regards to these hostages here, that they will be allowed to say that they're free, that they will be taken care of in the meantime, and most of all, that Yahweh will show his hand in this whole situation in Gaza, in Lebanon, in Syria, and most of all in Israel. Father, we pray you that you may, might make this not one of those situations as it were in 1979 where so many people suffered for so long. Rather, we pray that you would open wide the gates, open wide the gates, and that the king of glory might go into that place and succor the people that are there. We pray that you might convict and convince the hostage takers, that you might eliminate the situation entirely and give them peace and give us peace as well. And that goes also for our group gathered here today. Let them remember this in their free times and that they're free and that they're able to succor themselves and that you're here. But let them remember to pray, pray, pray. Amen. And that's your opening for today. Hey, thank you so much for that, Jackson. We appreciate that very much. And that's true. Pray, pray, pray. Uh, very important. And a great admonition, admonition to us as well. Okay, uh, so at this time, uh, we have a watch woman report. Know that, know that typically we have a watch men report. Well, interestingly enough, tonight we have a watch woman report. And I would like to present to you Lori, Sister Lori. Are you there, Sister? Let's see if we can get you on video here. I'm going to hit the start video and see if we can get you on there. Let's see here. There you are. There you are. Okay. All right, Lori. Go ahead. Shalom, shalom. Um, I... I... Uh, Brother Gregory, can you hear me okay? Yeah, you're coming through great. Awesome. Awesome. Hopefully the dogs will not be a distraction and start playing by my feet as they typically do. Um, I Brother Gregory had asked me to do a Watchman on the Watchman on the Wall uh, report and not sure why it came across this way to me, but I prayed about it and this is how it came across. So it was on my heart. Uh, hopefully this is what the Lord wanted me to cover. To just kind of um, help uh, remind, remind, remind uh, ourselves uh, to be the watchman on the wall of our lives, um, not just the watchman on the uh, politics scene. So um, this is I, I what came to me was a history of how our minds, uh, especially the baby boomer generation, has really been targeted as uh, a means of kind of influencing and controlling how people uh, think as a culture uh, using the television specifically, but that started back in the 1890s where Marconi had first developed the idea of a wireless telegraph or radio. And by 1893, Nikola Tesla made the first wireless radio. Um, the, the radio uh, broadcast the radio uh, broadcasting broadcasting company I so I wrote RCA but it's RBA um, was mostly controlled by one individual uh, and uh, a few wealthy people 
that was brought about because President Wilson was trying to outcompete the British undersea cable. Um, and they were first used by the Navy for military operations, but then became a means to communicate kind of a propagandize um, uh, ideas um, by, uh, by the government and by these uh, individuals who had control and influence. Um, and then came the television in 1927. Um, and by, it was invented in 1927 that by 1948, only about 1% of the United States had a television but by the 1960s, almost 90% of America owned at least one television. And that um, they were, they advertised that to be a way to bring the family together, but it also became very convenient to um, reach all the families um, now with a one-way conversation that came right into the homes that they could basically um, put on the entertainment box whatever they wanted to present. And they actually used it, um, as I will get to a little bit later. Um, and then in 1943, they invented computers. And now about 85% of adults have smartphones. So we take our computers everywhere we go with us, which again is mostly other than our phone calls is a one-way conversation with YouTube and all of the um, social media. All of the first companies that came about the, I think it was, I had all three of them. I apologize, I didn't write them down. Um, but they were all owned and headed by one family. So that's a lot of influence in the hands of, of a single family or few people. Um, in World War II, the women were shown on television as a way of saying that they were supporting the families, that they were equal to men and they, they um, advertised and, and um, really promoted the women to get out there and get jobs that typically were being held by men. And then after the war, they changed the image um, as women needing a hero, as being helpless, and they were just miserable at work and they were so happy to be back at home. And that was kind of a way of returning women back into, you know, out of, back out of the workforce and back into the home. And they also used television to break into getting women to start smoking. So there was, women uh, felt it was very taboo not to smoke. And so um, Ebernays was hired um, to break through that taboo. And he sought out a psychoanalyst to find out how to appeal to women to get them to smoke. And they organized a march against, the, um, against women not smoking and for the emaciation of women to be able to smoke. And guess what? It, it became a very popular thing for women to smoke at that time. So they're, they, they use it to achieve, um, to achieve a means a lot of times because it's a way that people use it for entertainment. And sometimes now I feel a lot of people are using it to entertain and babysit their children. They put out a lot of subliminal messages out there. Um, and especially we see a lot of subliminal messages in the media that's um, announcing their loyalty to the kingdom of darkness. Like some of the hand signals that you see on Spider-Man, I, I was ignorant to it. I didn't see it until I started looking into some of these uh, symbols that they use, um, but the, the sim symbol that they have with Spider-Man, even his hand signal, is an alliance uh, with the kingdom of darkness. And just like the okay signal that they, I won't do it towards you because I found out that when people do it, some of these signals towards people, it's, they use it in casting out witchcraft. But the okay signal is actually uh, the 666, where you have one six, the second six, and the third six. Um, it's on our money symbols. We don't even pay really attention sometimes to the things that we do work with every day, but on our money symbol, there are symbols on the money. Um, on the $1 bill, you will see signs of Freemasonry and the eye of Lucifer on top of the pyramid. Um, and it's all over in the media. If you look at the celebrities with the one eye, with the um, 666, held over the one eye and it's really very subliminal because it's everywhere 
I, I feel like we could become very numb to it. So I kind of wanted to just draw our attention back to remembering what is being fed to our the gates of our minds and our souls when we see it over and over and don't screen out um, what we're being exposed to. But Will Smith in the movie Focus actually said that they had programmed a man to look for the number 55. And he showed how all along the street that he was walking along on different people's shirts, they planted um, actual, um, like they staged it so that he would continuously see the number 55 so that he would pick out the number 55. Not that they necessarily, that it's necessarily one individual is targeted that way, but ideas go that way. Just like, when they were trying to get women out into the workforce, when they were trying to get women to smoke, and when they were trying to get women back into the home. And it's not just women. I just happened to be one topic that um, was easy for me to kind of select because they had used it in so many ways. Um, and that Romans, Romans reminds us not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. And Isaiah 26, 3 says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth thee. So when we're looking around at things in Israel, or um, when we're watching, we're choosing movies for our families to go to, and um, we're remembering that Israel uh, is kind of, is the source of all of our prophecy. And um, we're, the prophecy of Messiah first came through and his second coming um, is, is also staged around what is happening in Israel. Just as a memory, a reminder to always guard our, our minds and our hearts um, to not be easily thrown by what we see because the media is controlled by a select few. And so what we are actually told about what is happening uh, is influenced by a select number of people. And to remember to, in our entertainment, be very diligent uh, to be careful about what we are exposing our children and our families to, and not just to be mindlessly um, watching things that are, are planting subliminal messages. And to be the watchman of your heart, to keep vigilant on the walls of your family and friends um, as well. Um, in Nehemiah, the gate of the city that were, re that were rebuilt actually have a, another significance in the spiritual plane and also relationships. Each gate um, corresponds to different uh, areas of our lives. And I uh, just listed out some of the gates. And Proverbs 4.23 says, More than anything, guard your heart, for your life flows from it. Have nothing to do with a corrupt mouth. Keep devious lips from far from you. And focus your eyes straight ahead. Keep your gaze on what is in front of you. Watch your feet in the way and all your paths will be secure. Do not deviate a bit to the right or the left. Turn your feet away from evil. And Proverbs 25, 28 says, He hath that had no rule over his spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. Um, so the gates, the gates that Nehemiah was rebuilding, um, I have found a book on it and also a, an internet site that relayed some of how some of the gates re relate to our lives and um, we don't want to have broken down gates because then we don't have the protection over our city which is and I apologize for my misspellings in here um, I was running through this, this earlier today um, but we don't want to have broken down gates of our relationships um, by not maintaining you know that putting the effort in and not loving the Lord with all of our heart and and therefore also loving the people he puts around us but also um maintaining our souls um so the rebuilding the gates of our lives just like nehemiah rebuilt the gates of jerusalem um after their return from babylonia in about 606 bc to 586 the people were assigned to the sections of the walls um that were close to their homes so that they would be motivated and um and to protect to be protected also in the event if they were attacked um, there were 10 gates that were mentioned, and a few of them I put up here to remind us of how they relate to our lives. The sheep gate um, was where they brought in the sheep for sacrificial offerings into the temple. 
and is a reminder of the cross where Christ is the Lamb of God who took away our sins. And the fish gate was also on that on that area of the of the um, of Jerusalem, and it was one of the main entrances where they brought in fish from the sea. Um, and it's a reminder that we are to be fishers of men with the Great Commission. Um, always to be on our hearts whenever we're out, even when we're out in the city, to remind, just to be always willing to be with that witness uh, with people that we come across and in, even in our families to be that witness. Um, and the old gate was to remind us that the old nature of sin is now put off so it cannot dominate us. According to Romans 6, 6, the valley gate um, represents humility and being willing to occupy lowly positions in order to serve Adonai and according to Peter uh, 5 6 that Adonai and I apologize for the misspelling may exalt us in the due time according to Luke 14 and then the dung gate was uh, in the south was needed for was a reminder that we need constant cleansing um, and in this particular time I'm, I'm working uh, towards be, being this, um, trained in to deliverance ministry. And I thought it was interesting that the deliverance ministry actually is taken from Nehemiah. Part of it is where he not only repented on behalf of himself, but the entire nation and of Israel and also of all previous generations sins. And that's part of the deliverance ministry as well. Um, that there's biblical, there are biblical foundations for that and keeping our lives uh, a short account with the Lord and also being willing to apologize on behalf of our generations and repent for that um, so that we can uh, pray for the cleansing of our bloodline so that none of those generational sins come forward into our children. Um, in 2 Corinthians 10.5 uh, says we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take every captive thought to make it obedient to Christ. Just the reminder that if we rule of our own spirit, we can't really turn ourselves over to be mindless to um, things that are infiltrated with the occult and sensuality and seduction, crude speech and visual images that we really can't erase once we see them. Um, and to remember that the media is run by a few very wealthy and powerful people to kind of screen that, um, filter that through that lens. Um, and keep our minds renewed in God's word and watch over the gates of our eyes and ears and especially our children's eyes and ears gates and spending time in prayer and not forsake the assembly because iron sharpens iron. And I just want to say thank you for hearing me out. Amen. Amen. You know what? That was a fantastic presentation, sister. I am. I'm just thrilled. Uh, you know, that's a great watchman report. I must say. And so thank you again for that. And so at this time, uh, we have Sister Kim with us. Let me say a couple uh, things about Sister Kim for those of you who are out there online. Uh, Sister Kim, uh, she has a, a ND degree, and uh, hopefully I got the correct uh, uh, email address uh, corrected there. Get this out of the way. Um, get this seems to. There we go. Uh, and uh, she's got her cell number here for those who want to reach out to her, but she has a presentation here, and there's a little bit of biographical information about Kim. Uh, she's been in the healing arts, teaching wellness uh, for well over 35 years, and there's some other information there uh, that you'll be able to look at later on the recording. So at this time, I would like to present to you Sister Kim Erickson. Let me get you uh, off of mute here, sister. Uh, let's see, ask to unmute. Hit that button there so you're off mute. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Thank you so much, Brother Gregory, and shalom, shalom, everyone. It's it's wonderful to be back and to hear that, Lori. That was wonderful. Um, Watchman report that you just gave us. And so timely, Every uh, everyone, what you're saying and the, the times that we're living in. I had a very interesting email um, sent by a dear friend of mine talking about the state of Israel and what's going to happen there and how things have been planned for quite some time and what the future is holding for us. And 
I do feel that we need to, well, we need to be prepared as, as Abba teaches us in his word, as well as I believe in being a good steward of what he's given us. And that is our bodies and our temple. So thank you, Brother Gregory, for that intro. I have been like over 35 years into healing um, this physical, emotional, and spiritual. We are spirit, soul, and bodies. It was interesting to, uh, about two hours ago, I saw, I, I follow a rabbi. I've known him for about four or five years. And he actually posted something that I had never heard him post before. He's obviously doing the parish, you know, the, um, as the, as we go through um, the Torah and we're in Genesis and um, appreciate, appreciate anyway, he, he was talking about Avraham and how, how he brought this in understanding um, from the sages, of course, he is a rabbi of, of what faith Enuma um, in Hebrew is and how the faith of Avraham brought about his fate because Sarah could not um, obviously conceive and he was past the age, but he talked about the first time it was fascinating once again, that everything is energy, but he brought it from scripture. I never really heard anyone give the understanding of the verses that he did. And once again, I just had to smile because we know from Proverbs, as a person thinks, so are they. Um, and, and what this rabbi friend of mine was talking about was how we understood physics. And then, and of course, um, how you know it was matter and now we went into the quantum physics and aspect of that and how we know that everything is a frequency everything is vibrating and i i touched on that last week we think things are solid but if you look under a high powered microscope you see that the atoms are actually are actually vibrating that everything is vibrating that our words um our thoughts Everything has a frequency. In fact, our organs, which I've been teaching for 35 years, our organs have a certain frequency. And also how our thoughts, um, the higher the frequency, the heal, like living in love, living in gratitude, living in, of course, that's all scriptural, how we're to love one another, how we're to love um, our Abba, and how we're to understand his word, how we're to be grateful, to come with thanksgiving on our lips. Well, those are our higher frequencies and we have devices that I've been using that actually quantify that. So I felt it was fascinating, the fruits of the spirit, um, love, joy, patience, and yet the lower frequencies are, of course, jealousy, bitterness, hatred, revenge, those are very low frequencies. And when you live in those frequencies, you actually will um, show different physical ailments and illnesses, um, unforgiveness can, you know, they've proven has caused cancer. So I say medical science always, always, um, I guess, verifies scripture and God's word. Well, tonight, I wanted to just take a quick 10 minutes to look at something I had a PowerPoint done on um, many, many years ago. And Brother Gregory was so sweet to have me see how we could do this. And I just want to show you because last night when I mentioned the vibrational frequencies of the essential oils, the life, the, the immune system of the plant and life force of the plant and why Genesis and Ezekiel and Revelation talked about that, I want to show you the scripture verses because I, I didn't, I wasn't able to last week. But in Proverbs 21, 20, the Lord says there is a treasure to be desired and oil in the dwelling of the wise. So the company that I've been with for 25 years, my mother and I, uh, the mission statement was to have these essential oils, these God's gifts to mankind in every medicine cabinet. So tonight I wanted to take a quick, quick view of what I meant by all of this. And of course, here were the verses, some of the verses that I referred to last week, Ezekiel 47, 12, um, that the fruit should be for our fruit and the leaves of these plants for our medicine. It is in scripture, the leaves of the trees are for the healing of the Gentiles in Revelation 22, 2. So I wanted to just 
touch on this from the beginning. God had, the Father had um, started with the oils, the essential oils, which in the Garden of Eden, we were actually able to smell. And of course, by the end of Genesis with Joseph and Jacob, always they were embalming people then with the essential oils. It was a mainstay in the houses. Of course, by the time Yeshua came, we see how um, they brought the gifts of frankincense and myrrh and gold was actually balsam fir 2000 years ago. So I wanted to just touch you know, on some of these verses, like in James 5, 14, where the father says, if the sick, if there's any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him doing what? Anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. It wasn't olive oil. It was frankincense. It was myrrh. It was all these essential oils that I've been teaching on for all of these years. Um, there's actually a thousand times in scripture where essential oils for therapy and for use are mentioned in scripture. Um, and every time indeed you see the, the word incense, they're talking about frankincense. Um, as I wanted to just teach you really quick from this PowerPoint, what essential oils are. I think I touched on that last week. If you, if you, if you remember, um, there are the they're extracted from the plants, which the father says, Abba says, is for our healing. But it actually establishes normal cell function and regenerates at the cell level. It increases oxygen and strengthens our immune system. And as you know, after coming out of COVID, we have issues with not enough oxygen. Well, if you are putting essential oils on your feet and on your hands and diffusing them and using them, your cells would have been oxygenated. As we know, the anointing of all the kings um, in scripture, they were anointing once again, it wasn't olive oil, it was cassia and hyssop and frankincense. All of the oils that they've been using for all these centuries, when Samuel took a flask of oil to pour it over Saul's head. He was, um, all of these, all of these kings, all of these prophets were being anointed and it didn't stop. We were never supposed to stop anointing with oil. So I've been using oil and anointing people's feet and their head and their bodies for, for decades now. Leviticus 8, Psalms 133 too. Always that in scripture, it's talking about essential oils. Of course, Queen Esther was actually bathing in myrrh for six months before she was married to, um, to Artaxerxes. And of course, it says in scripture that she was being prepared for the marriage of the king. Well, aren't we all being prepared for the marriage of the king? So why are we not using these essential oils? This is more scriptures on the of myrrh and cassia. When you see aloes, that's actually sandalwood, just like incense is frankincense. So because we do the original Hebrew, these were things that I looked up and studied all these years. There are so many verses. Uh, on, on how to use these oils or that we were to use these oils. There's of course ancient and modern uses for myrrh. Not only was Queen Esther um, bathing in myrrh, but now we know that myrrh is being, in, and birthing mothers were always being anointed with myrrh. Of course, it was against, um, it helped uh, fight against infection and such, but it's great for gingivitis and, and fungal infections and urinary tract infections. We need to have these oils in our, in our medicine cabinets. We won't be able to just go to our physician, especially if the grid goes down, or if other things happen where we won't be able to get antibiotics and the things that we have been programmed, and I say that word very, very succinctly, programmed to use. Antibiotics, anti is against, biotic is life. It's time we learn that in the church. Of course, um, I, 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 I go to many, many churches and have been teaching this for probably two to three decades now. These were just some of the, the research that I was showing about essential oils, how they can cross the blood brain barrier, how you can diffuse it and it kills airborne pathogens. Mold is a big issue, especially here in the South, in South Carolina. If you looked at the, the land, uh, not Lander, the, um, the Greenwood uh, um, newspaper, they had a whole front page article on how 
all of the college students were actually, some were dying, they were sick with ADD and different issues because of mold in their dormitories and in their rooms. Most homes have mold. And that's why we diffuse our oils, the thieves oils that many of you might know of, but they do repair and regenerate damaged nerve tissues. The receptor sites of our cells can get eroded, uh, eroded and how the, the divine creator has put these imprints into these essential oils. So that was just some of the things and some of the scripture verses I wanted to share with you tonight about frankincense oil being the second most mentioned oil, of course, in scripture. I didn't know if you knew this, but a tree had to be 40 years old before even one drop of this precious oil could be extracted. So I've been over to the Middle East and we have our frankincense trees in the company that I uh, teach about. Um, I could go on and on about what this oil is good for. Of course, we have ancient and modern uses for frankincense. Great for the respiratory. Once again, they say that there's going to be another pandemic. Um, we need to be prepared, everyone. And I love you very much. I give you my phone number and free of charge to call me if you want to learn anything more about these oils the research of these oils, once again, supporting your respiratory infection, your bronchitis, your pneumonia. Please, you do not need to get a flu vaccine. You need to be diffusing the essential oils. Of course, the ancient uses of cedar wood. We all know where that comes from um, and, and why uh, Solomon used cedar in, in building the temple. The modern uses for cedar wood are amazing. Um, this is, you know, my dear friend, Dr. Terry Friedman, he did a whole research on cedar wood and how it helps with ADD and ADHD. Adults have it as well as our children. Please don't put them on Ritalin. Please don't put them on all of these um, medical drugs You can when you can use God's medicine. So um, I give just different research here, the use of Cypress. Once again, Cypress is great on a physical level like circulation, but it's also great on an emotional and spiritual level, especially if you've had uh, loss. I started you diffusing Cypress for that, a loss of a loved one, as most of us have had, a loss of a job, um, a loss in, uh, of a spouse, anything. Um, Cypress is really good for that. Um, these are some of the modern uses of Cypress, of course. Um, I was talking about supporting the bones as well as swelling. How many people have swelling in their, their legs, in their, their ankles, and they're taking more and more medications and the side effects of the medications, they get on more medications. Why not just use God's medicine for that? Why not use to strengthen those blood capillaries that are being, that are being man-made of the COVID and some of these man-made viruses are destroying your capillaries? Well, we need to be using God. God knew, the Father knew that this was going to happen. And he said, ancient secrets are now coming back for us for modern times. This is research done on Cyprus oil. Um, uh, Dr. Swartz was a professor of psychology and psychiatry. He actually showed what Cyprus is good for, sandalwood in scripture. Um, like I said, there's literally hundreds of different um, scripture verses on it. I just wanted to show you what you can do to, to heal your DNA um, and oxygenate your systems with what we know. Different testimonials from some of my friends who've been using these essential oils. Um, you are screen sharing. Okay. <laughs> this is kind of new for me. Cassia, you, you read this in scripture. Well, what is it good for? Here's ancient and modern uses for Cassia. Okay. Antifungal, antibacterial. These guys, we all need these in our medicine cabinet. Anytime, please give me a call. I'll tell you how to have it in your medicine cabinets so that when you come down overnight with something, you've got what the Father has given us, what Abba has given us to, to, to resolve that. Um, spikenard, a lot of you know I cut off my finger. And when I use spikenard, which is what was anointed on Yeshua um, as, as Mary was preparing him for those lashes for the cross, 
It um, actually goes in to penetrate seven layers of your skin. My finger, you would never know that it was cut off because I had spikenard and I had helichrysum to repair the DNA and to put my finger back on with no scars and no stitches. When my, my friend who's a medical student told me I needed 25 stitches, I saved myself thousands of dollars and did it, did it um, Abba's way. So here we go. Um, Yeshua was using, of course, the oils. And this is research that was done on spikenard oil and what it's good for ancient and modern uses for spikenard. Once again, all of these oils are great for antibacterial, antifungal, anti-inflammatory, um, and of course, repair for your tissues. Um, you can use these for emotional support as well. Hyssop, purge me with hyssop. Uh, King David said, and unwash me, I will be clean and whiter than snow. The, they all use these essential oils. I'm bringing back these ancient truths into modern understanding. Here's research for hyssop and how to use it and why, and why the, the priests were commanded to use and take hyssop and to use it. Mm -hmm. um, ancient and modern uses for hyssop once again. This was a great testimonial done by a friend of mine and how frankincense and hyssop saved her from her asthmatic attacks. Um, myrtle, why we see that in scripture, Isaiah, I, um, Jeremiah, Nehemiah, all the scripture verses. I don't have time to go over all of them, but once again, here's the research that is being done. Um, why Myrtle is, is great. Um, Dr. Uh, Pignol is another friend that I had met who was talking about his research about Myrtle being great to balance your hormones. FYI, men, men have hormones too, but we hear all these issues with our thyroid and hyperthyroid or hypothyroid, and they give you medications. Well, why not use God's gifts to us? So we know that myrtle supports the thyroid. It's great for sinus infections as well. It's great for so many things, muscle spasms, hormone balancing, as we talked about. Here's my dear friend, Dr. Um, well, her name is Janet McBride. She's a singer and, um, and, and, and has a, a ministry in that. And when she would lose her her voice, she would put myrtle on and it brought back her voice. These every, uh, we do have churches where a lot of people who are in the choir note and have a bottle of myrtle on them at all times so that they um, can use it if need be. The Rose of Sharon, look at this in scripture. It's so beautiful that what scripture being brought scripture to life where you see ancient and modern uses for the Rose of Sharon, which is also called cystus. It actually is better than, um, than the, the drugs that they're using to um, to prevent, well, they don't prevent, well, to prevent clots, what they do is they give you um, Coumadin, it's a, it's a drug to thin your blood. Why not use what God's given us? Cystus oil does it much better than man's drugs. Um, Akna, uh, there's, like I said, there's just so many more um, scripture verses, Galbium in Exodus, when, when Moses was, when the Lord told Moses to make um, the famous essential oil blend that we use. Well, what is it good for? Well, now we know why it's good for, why they use these oils, why the Father, Abba, wants us to be using them today and why we do need them in our medicine cabinet when things happen to help others, to help ourselves. Um, I was talking about how all of these emotions can cause illnesses. Well, guess what? The oils are used to remove these um, lower frequencies and lower vibrations and emotions so that we can live to 120 years old without having any illness or disease, which is what the father has spoken about in scripture, but the world, we haven't done it Abba's way and we're suffering because of it. So just to recap, I wanted to let you know that these essential oils that are spoken about in scripture are for our healing and why they've been used for eons for centuries and why the father is bringing them back today. So I just wanted to let you know about some of these um, 
um, there's 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 a, a wonderful friend of mine wrote a book called Healing Oils of the Bible. His name is Dr. David Stewart. Um, I have that book if anybody would like like that or for me to send you any emails on this and where you can get these oils in scripture. And I don't know how we are at times since I haven't been looking at it, but, yeah, but I just uh, wanted... we're, we're, uh, let's let's uh, shift now and let me put up Kim's uh, let me put up Kim's information for you guys. Can we do that here? Yeah, let's see here. Let me let me put her information here for you guys out there. Reach out to Kim at the 8 Solution at gmail.com. Text or call Kim Erickson, uh, 864 area code 380-6838. I believe I have that correct now, don't I, sister? 864-380-6838. And I think uh, you guys will be able to connect with her and get a lot of information uh, from her. And very much um, yeah, of what you have brought. Please for reach out. Yeah. Yes, I would love to, to meet you guys um, in the mid the midweek. Well, we are midweek, but throughout the week. Thank you so much, Brother Gregory. Okay. So, All right. So at this time, we have Brother James presenting to us another installment of the America's Foundations, I believe. Are you there, brother? Yes, I am. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yeah, we can. Let's see if we can get this. I'm going to hit the start video buttons. Let's see if it'll work this time now that it's gone to the shop. Let's see if it'll work. Start video. Did you get the prompt? Yes, I did. Okay. Well, let's see if it'll... I wonder if there's tape over your... Oh, there it comes. It's coming through. It's just taking a minute to materialize. I see you got your... Uh, you got that uh, that hat that I like on there. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm glad you can see it. My, my picture here looks like a reverse negative, only psychedelic. It's just really strange. <laughs> <laughs> it, it might straighten out, but go ahead and share your uh, material if you can. See, I don't know. Uh, you, you should have the share capability. Well, I just hit the share button and I've got a window that has um, that has my email, my Zoom, and my uh, PowerPoint all in one. Okay, yeah. And then click on the PowerPoint and then hit the share button. And that little box it comes up. Yeah, I see. Okay, there it is. All right, it's coming. Let's see, it's starting to share screen. All right, there we go. Okay, we got it. Okay, we're all set. Okay, well, if everyone will remember <clears throat> the last uh, the last series in or the last episode in this series. We did the uh, the remonstrance of the, uh, the the of the state or the kingdom of England, and we discussed how it had a great effect on the um, the foundational documents of our of our nation, the Constitution and the uh, the, the Declaration of Independence. <clears throat> Now, because there was so much American history was influenced by those events going on in the British Isles, and especially the changes of that type of government over the British people during the 16th and 17th centuries, I feel it is expedient to do a, to get a little more knowledgeable of what led up to that civil war and to note how our founding fathers, uh, how they learned valuable lessons from that event. And <clears throat> can you see the whole thing here? Or is it blocked? Mine is blocked. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. We've got civil war on the new world and so on. Okay. I uh I think I've got it a little bit better. I'm gonna have to uh I'm gonna have to do away with my thumbnail picture so I can read the whole thing. <clears throat> so the importance of the English Civil War 
on what became the new world is very important in understanding how our forefathers seen events and how they used what they seen to develop our constitution. So understanding some of the deeper roots of the British people, and that also is the understanding of the Hebraic two houses, um, will give us a better insight into the religious turmoil that was going on during this period. So the importance of the of the English Civil War on the New World, to, to better understand the effects of that war, we need to look at a little of the background for what culminated in a civil war actually had its roots much earlier in the English or British history. <clears throat> so we go back to the rise of the Stuarts and King Charles. England's last Tudor uh, monarch, Elizabeth I, died in 1603 and was succeeded by her cousin, James Stuart. Already King James VI of Scotland, and he became King James I of England and Ireland as well uniting the three kingdoms under a single ruler for the first time. Though at first, the Catholic minority in England welcomed James's ascension to the throne, they later turned against his regime, even attempting to blow up the king and parliament in the gunpowder plot of November 5th, 1605. The plot was organized by a Robert Catsby in an effort to end the persecution of the Roman Catholics by the English government. Catsby and others hoped to replace the country's Protestant government with Catholic leadership. <clears throat> In this next slide, we'll see that the stage is being set for, a, uh, for the liberty that we today take for granted. We need to note also that the goal of the Puritans at that time was the restoration of a pure scriptural practice of their faith, not unlike the Messianic movement of today. Our advantage is that we have far better understanding of scriptures, in part due to the archaeological discoveries and corrections of mistranslated scriptures. So going now to the... Uh, what led up to these wars, James's son, Charles I, succeeded him on the throne in 1625. His marriage to a Catholic princess, Henrietta Maria of France, fueled suspicions, especially among the more radical Protestants. Some of those were Puritans. And that the king would introduce Catholic, they were afraid that the king would introduce Catholic trans, uh, traditions back into the Church of England. Charles also believed strongly in his divine right to rule, and in 1629, he dismissed Parliament altogether, and he would not recall it for another 11 years. Um, and we will see that there was a, a term given to that period of time and a little bit later. But first, I want to do just a little bit of background. Who were the Puritans? Well, the Pur Puritans were members of religious reform movement known as Puritan, Puritanism, which arose within the Church of England in the late 16th century. They believed the Church of England was too similar to the Catholic Roman Catholic Church, and they, would, and they should eliminate the ceremonies and practices that were not rooted in the Scriptures themselves. The Puritans felt that they had a direct covenant with Elohim, so they uh, to enact these reforms. So, under siege from the church and crown, certain groups of Puritans migrated to northern English colonies in the New World in the 1620s and 1630s, laying the foundation for the religious, intellectual, and social order of New England. The aspects of Puritanism have reverberated throughout America. Uh, American life ever since. In keeping with their focus on the home, Puritan migration to the New World usually consisted of the entire families rather than just the young single men who comprised many other European settlements. Now, all of this came from the, uh, uh, the history uh, channel on the, uh, on the internet here. <clears throat> and after this 
episode of the series, the next thing I want to go into will be uh, Puritan or Pilgrim. Uh, we will go into that difference in the next edition of this series. Um, hopefully that will be next week. So as was brought out in our last episode in this series, England under Charles I enjoyed relative peace until around 1630. However, by the late 1630s, Charles's regime had become unpopular across the board, uh, across a broad front throughout his kingdom. During the period of his so-called personal rule, which was 1629 to 1640, was he, this was known by his enemies as the 11-year tyranny because he had dissolved parliament and ruled by decree. Charles had resorted to dubious fis fiscal expedients, most notably a ship, a ship money tax, which was an annual levy for the reform of the Navy that in 1635 was extended not just to, from the English ports, but to the inland towns as well. And this caused a lot of uh, anxiety among those who lived inland because they did not feel that they should have to pay the shipping taxes that the uh, the elite who were uh, the shipbuilders and the shippers themselves um, should have been paying. So this inclusion of inland uh, inland towns was construed as a new tax without parliamentary authorization. When combined with ecclesiastical reforms undertaken by Charles's close advisor, William Lode, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and with the conspicuous role assume, assumed in these reforms by Henrietta Maria, Charles's Catholic queen and her courtiers, many in England, became alarmed. Nevertheless, despite grumblings, there was little doubt that had Charles managed to rule his other dominions as he controlled England, his peaceful reign might have been extended indefinitely, but Scotland and Ireland proved to be his undoing. Beginning in the late 1630s, Charles made efforts to establish a more English-like religious practice in Scotland, generating fierce resistance among the country's Presbyterian majority. A Scottish army defeated Charles's forces and invaded England forcing Charles to recall Parliament in 1640 to generate the money to pay for his troops and settle the conflict. Instead, Parliament acted quickly to restrict the king's powers, even ordering the trial and execution of one of his chief ministers, Lord Stafford, who was eventually put to death. So this set the stage of what became known as the Bishop's War. <clears throat> now, the war in Scotland known as the uh, Bishop's War, the rumblings in the kingdom, um, as, as we look at some of um, the foundational or the fundamental issues which had precipitated these wars, which led up to the England Civil War, we notice how they began to revolve around religious issues. Not that the Scots, uh, we must note that the Scots were primarily Presbyterian. And this will uh, precipitate more understanding once we get a little bit further into the consequences of this war. So the Bishop's War, Wars, and the Return of Parliament from 1640 to 1642. Now, the, uh, this was what became known as the Short Parliament. The turn of events in Scotland horrified Charles, who determined to bring the rebellious Scots to heel. However, the Covenanters, as the Scottish rebels became known, quickly overwhelmed the, po uh, overwhelmed the poorly trained English army, forcing the king to sign a peace treaty at Berwick in June 18, 1639. Though the Covenanters had won this first bishop's war, Charles refused to concede victory and called an English parliament, seeing it as the only way to raise money quickly. Parliament assembled in April 1640, but it lasted only three weeks, and hence it became known as the Short Parliament. The House of Commons was willing to vote the huge sums of money the king needed to finance this war against the Scots, but 
not until their grievances, some dating back more than a decade, had been redressed. Furiously, Charles precipitately dissolved the short parliament. As a result, it was an untrained, ill-armed, and poorly paid force that trailed north to fight the Scots in the Second Bishop's War. On August 20th, 1640, the Covenanters invaded England for the second time, and in a spectacular military campaign, they took Newcastle following the Battle of Newburn, August 28th. This demoralized and hum humiliated the king, and, and the king had no alternative but to negotiate and at the insistence of the Scots to recall the parliament. The new parliament, now called the Long Parliament, which had no which no one dreamed would sit for the next 20 years, assembled at Westminster on November 3rd, 1640, and immediately called for the impeachment of Wentworth who by now was the Earl of Stafford. The lengthy trial at Westminster ended with Stafford's execution on May 12, 1641. That was orchestrated by the Protestants and Catholics from Ireland, by Scottish Covenanters, and by the King's English opponents, especially the leader of Commons, <clears throat> Joe's, uh, John Pine, effectively highlighting the importance of the connection between all of, uh, all of the Stuart kingdoms at this critical junction in history. Because of the, the um, Scottish rebellion or the Scottish wars, there was a lot of atrocities that were committed. And this upset a lot of the the um, a lot of the Irish uh, Catholics, and thus this led to the the Ireland's rebellion, which later became known as the Irish War. So, to some extent, the removal of Stafford's draconian hand facilitated the outbreak in October 1641 of the Ulster Uprising in Ireland. This rebellion derived, on the one hand, from long-term social, religious, and economic causes, namely uh, tenorial insecurity, economic instability, indebtedness, and a desire to have the Roman Catholic Church restored to its pre-Reformation position. And on the other hand, from short-term political factors, the outbreak of violence. Inevitably, bloodshed and unnecessary cruelty accompanied the insurrection, which quickly engulfed the island and took the form of a popular uh, uprising, pitting Catholic na uh, natives against the Protestant newcomers. While Protestants claimed that over 100,000 were killed by the Catholics, and that may be an exaggeration, much more common was the plundering and pillaging of Protestant property and the theft of livestock. These human and material losses were replicated on the Catholic side as the Protestants retaliated. The Irish Rebellion of 1641 <clears throat> by Catholics in Ireland, whose demands included an end to anti-Catholic discrimination, greater Irish self-governance, and a return of confiscated Catholic lands. These were confiscated by the Scottish Covenanters. Its timing was particularly driven by the dispute between Charles I and his opponents, the English parliamentarians and the Scottish Covenanters, who were uh, working in conjunction at that point, which the, rebel, uh, the rebels feared would lead to an invasion and further anti-Catholic measures. Beginning as an attempted coup attack, by Catholic gentry and military officers, it developed into a widespread rebellion <clears throat> and ethnic conflict with English and Scottish Protestant settlers. While Charles and Parliament sought to quell the Abella rebellion, neither side trusted the other with control of any army raised to do so. One of the issues that led to the first English Civil War in August 1642. 
And I would like to comment this time. Um, some of you may un may question why we're going into so much of this English um, history and wars. But I think when we come to the end of these slides, I think you will begin to see how these things have tied into our own political uh, system today. <clears throat> And ex exceptional cruelties occurred on both sides, with the common people receiving the brunt of their trepidations. A contemporary Catholic source wrote that O'Neill strove to contain the rascal multitude from those frequent savage actions of stripping and pulling. But the floodgate of raping, once laid open, or once being laid open, the meaner sort of people was not to be constrained or contained. <clears throat> and um, we get to the next next uh, slide. I'm going to have to warn you ahead of time, some of these pictures, even though they are not true pictures, they are only wood carvings, um, they are a bit um, traumatic to, to look at. But it's, it has been argued that the initial purpose of the attacks was economic, and killing occurred only when the victims resisted. They, had, they intensified as the rebellion progressed, though, particularly in Ulster, where many had lost land to the post-1607 plantations, while attacks on local Protestant clergy were in part due to resentment on the relative wealth of the Church of Ireland in that province. Other factors included religion and culture, in County Cavan, rebels justified the rising in a defensive measure against a Protestant threat to extirpate the Catholic religion, reinstated original Irish language, place names, and banned the use of English. <coughs> Excuse me. Caught between the violent countermeasures of the state and an increasingly populist uprising, which threatened the existent social order, the Catholic elite struggled to regain the initiative. In 1642, the landowners, assisted by the clergy, uh, clergy created an alternate power base in Kilkenny. The primary function of this Confederate association was to restore order and negotiate a settlement with the king. For the next six years, the Confederates functioned as a de facto government of Ireland, controlling vast tracts of the island apart from the enclaves of Dublin, Cork, and Northeast Ulster. And again, I will warn you that some of these pictures are not too pleasant. Uh, many atrocities were recorded during the Catholic Irish Rebellion. And below are a few of the wood cuttings. These wood cuttings were actually put into the London newspapers and used to bring about um, more, to, to get more people involved in the war. And if you'll notice the bottom, um, the bottom picture, it just makes me think of what has recently occurred in in um, Israel itself with with the stripping babies out and, and um, although they were they weren't burning them as this picture indicates, but they were uh, they were ripping people women open and taking the babies and beheading them. <clears throat> So the Grand Remonstrance of, of 1649 was a list of grievances issued by Parliament against King Charles I of England. It recorded that Parliament saw what Parliament saw as the monarch's abuse of power, his illegal raising of taxes outside of Parliament, and the promotion of certain unwelcome religious reforms and the use of unwise counselors. Due to the unwise counsel of Charles's trusted friends, as well as his constant illegal rise, raising of taxes, pardon me, and his promotion of unwelcome religious reforms, the populace, as well as many in Parliament, were becoming disenchanted with the monarchy. This, along with Charles's 11-year tyrannical reign mentioned earlier, led to much confusion and fear among the people. The pushing of religious reform set the stage for conflict between the Protestant and Catholic factions, thus leading to 
First, the Scottish Wars, the Bishop Wars, as they were sometimes called, and then the retaliation of the Irish Catholics against both the Protestants and the army of the king. So it was inevitable, inevitable that all-out war would break out among these disenfranchised, disenfranchised groups. Easy for some to say. So what happened in 1642 was the result of years of bad decisions and over taxation. Although recruiting, equipping, and supplying their armies initially proved problematic for both sides, by the end of 1642, each army between 60 and 70,000 men in the field. <clears throat> King Charles's trusted friends remind me of Rehoboam's consulting with his young friends, as we see in King uh, 1 Kings chapter 12, verses 8 through 11, where his young men told him to make, make the, um, the forced work details work harder and to, uh, to make them hate the, the, uh, the King, King Solomon even more. So we now move into the first of the English Civil Wars, which went from 1642 to 1646. The first major battle fought on English soil, the Battle of Edgehill, um, in October of 1642, quickly demonstrated that a clear advantage was enjoyed by neither. The Royalists, also known as the Cavaliers, who were with the king, nor the parliamentarians, also known as roundheads. Sieges and skirmishes, rather than pitched battles, dominated the military landscape in England during the First Civil War, as local garrisons determined to destroy the economic basis of their opponents while preserving their own resources scrambled for territory. Charles and his cavaliers, with his headquarters in Oxford, enjoyed support in the north and west of England, in Wales, and after 1643 in Ireland. Parliament, on the other hand, controlled the much wealthier areas of the south and east of England, together with most of the key ports, and critically, London, the financial capital of the kingdom. In order to win the war, Charles needed to capture London, and this was something that he consistently failed to do. Charles prevented the parliamentarians from smashing his main field army. The result was an effective military stalemate until the triumph of the Roundheads at the Battle of Marston Moor on July 2nd, 1644. This decisive victory deprived the king of two field armies and, equally important, paved the way for the reform of the parliamentary armies with the creation of a new model army, completed in April 1645. Thus, by 1645, Parliament had created a centralized standing army with central funding and central direction. And as you see at the bottom, all of this information um, on the English Civil War has come from the um, Britannica, the Encyclopedia people. The New Model Army now moved against the Royalist forces. Their closely fought victory in the Battle of Naseby in June of four, uh, June 14, 6, by the turning point in parliamentary forms fortunes and marked the beginning of a string of stunning successes. Langport in July 10th, Roten Heath on September 24th, and an Moor on October 20, uh, 21st. That evident eventually forced the king to surrender to the Scots at Newark on May 5th, 16, or, uh, 1646, <clears throat> thus ending the First, uh, first English War. It is doubtful whether Parliament could have won the First English War without Scottish intervention. Royalist successes in England in the spring and early summer of 1643, combined with the prospect of aid from Ireland for the king, prompted the Scottish governors to sign a political, military, and religious alliance, the Solemn League and Covenant of September 25th, 1643. They signed this with the English parliamentarians. 
des desperate to protect their revolution at home, the Covenanters insisted upon the establishment of Presbyterianism in England, and in return agreed to send an army of 21,000 men to serve there. These troops played a critical role at Marston Moor, with the Covenanting General David Leslie briefly replacing the wounded Oliver Cromwell in the midst of the action. For his part, Charles looked to uh, Ireland for support. However, the Irish troops that finally arrived in Wales after a ceasefire was concluded with the Confederates in 1767, uh, in September 1643, never equaled the Scottish presence, which, er, while the king's willingness to secure aid from Catholic Ireland sullied his his reputation in England. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Second and Third English Civil Wars, 1648 through 1651. Although the Scottish Covenanters had made a significant contribution to Parliament's victories in the First English Civil War during the Second from 16, in 1648 and the Third English Civil War in 1650 and 1651, they turned and supported the king. On December 26, 1647, Charles signed an agreement known as the Engagement with a number of leading Covenanters. In return for the establishment of Presbyterianism in England for a period of three years, the Scots promised to join forces with the English royalists and to restore the king to his throne. Early in July 1648, a Scottish force invaded England, but the parliamentary army routed it at the Battle of Preston in, on August 17th. The execution of Charles I in January of 1649 merely served to galvanize Scottish and Irish support for the king's son, Charles II, who was crowned King of the Scots at Scone near Perth on January 1st, 1651. Ultimately, the defeat of the combined force of Irish royalists and Confederates at the hand of English parliamentarians <clears throat> after August 1649 prevented the Irishmen from serving alongside their Scottish and English allies in the Third English Civil War. As it was, this war was largely, largely fought on Scottish soil. Oliver Cromwell and his new model army having invaded Scotland in July 1650. Despite being routed by the, at the Battle of Dunbar, 17, uh, September 3rd, 1650, which Cromwell regarded as one of the most signal mercies God hath, in, hath done for England and his people. The Scots managed to raise another army that made a spectacular dash into England. This wild attempt to capture London came to nothing. Cromwell, uh, Cromwell's resounding victory at Worcester, se September 3rd, 1651, and Charles II's subsequent flight to France not only gave Cromwell control over England, but also effectively ended the wars <clears throat> the, uh, the, and the wars of the three kingdoms. So as we have seen throughout these rebellions and wars, one of the major bones of contention was found in the realm's interference with the religion of the people. It was well noted by our founding fathers, who needed to assure the states that the government had no business establishing the religion of the people, period. While today there are many who like to spew the adage, separation of church and state, this was nowhere found in any of the original founding documents. It was quoted of Thomas Jefferson from a letter written to the Danbury Baptist Association of Connecticut in 1802. The founders and authors of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence recognized the need for government to stay out of the affairs of religion. They had the not-so-old lesson of what happened in England when the king tried to establish his presence in the religion of the realm. It is my personal opinion that Almighty Yah inspired our founders in the drafting of our Constitution and the limitations on, the, on our government. Sadly, we the people have been very lazy about our duties to assure that only those with moral values become our representatives.
We have allowed immoral and irreligious people to hold offices, which has led to the situation we now have with abortion, sexual perversions, and lawlessness. And the church's own lawlessness has contributed greatly to this. Coming next in the next of the series will be the influence of the Puritans and the Pilgrims on the New World. With that, may you all be blessed and y'all watch over and, and provide for all of your needs. Shalom, shalom. Wow, that was a great recounting uh, of the history of Britain, which has uh, incredible impact on the formation of this country and much of the caveats, much of the protections that were put in place was based upon all of this history. And so this is why it's very good for all of us here in America to understand this and also to do all we can to safeguard what little liberty we have left. Although it seems to be slipping away uh, little by little, but uh, those of us who can and know about this need to be vigilant. So we thank you again, Brother James. And so at this time, uh, what I'm gonna do is simply uh, do the final blessing. And because I believe we have a meeting, uh, we're not gonna do a particular prayer meeting. I will do a closing prayer, uh, but uh, I think Dr. Snyder, uh, we're gonna have a Yahad uh, meeting uh, for those uh, um, after this service and we'll turn the recording off after we finish the final blessing. Okay, and so uh, let's ask the Father's blessing tonight and uh, that you all would be blessed. And I hope that you got something out of the service. I hope that you were encouraged. And even though the devil did try to get in shortly, I got rid of that devil that came in. But you know what? Uh, Yah controls all and we can uh, continue to put our, our shields up and our guards up. Uh, but let's ask the Father to bless uh, this continuing week uh, until we come to the Sabbath. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all that went into the formation of this country. We thank you for the knowledge of health that has come to us. We thank you for the admonition that we need to be careful what we put before our eyes. Father, help us to heed these things. Help us to pick up these things and apply them to our lives Father, if there's any needs out there, we ask that you would address them and just help those people in need. In the name of Yeshua Messiah, amen. Okay, uh, and so the final blessing. Yivarekeka Yahweh vayishmareka Ya her Yahweh, Ponobaleka, Pikuneka. Ye say Yahweh, Ponobaleka, Via Sam Leka, Leka Shalom. Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. Yahweh lift up his countenance on you and give you shalom in the name of Yeshua Messiah, Prince of Peace. And so now the service is finito uh, and here's some contact information. For those of you out there, cyberspace, uh, here's Dr. Jack Snyder. You can get a hold of him by going to veroyahad at gmail.com. Get a hold of myself, yahadgreenwood at gmail.com. Uh, the local Greenwood uh, Yahad is the hmisrael.com and the New Earth Restoration uh, website is Viral Yahad. And this has been a presentation brought to you by New Earth Restoration and Hebrew Messianic Israel. We are fellowships in Yahad. My name is Brother Gregory Smith, and we hope that you have an enjoyable rest of the week. Shalom, shalom.